I'm here to talk to you about a lot of technology, but I do robotics, and one of the first questions I always get is, is a robot going to take my job? So that's what the question I'm going to answer for you today. So I was in the Navy. I did fly F-18s, and I flew A-4s as well, uh, which are smaller, actually more fun to fly planes. But one of the things that I did in, these, um, in this environment, of course, that's what, all, what makes a Navy pilot better than all other pilots, especially Air Force pilots, is the carrier. <laughs> and it was my time at the carrier where I really saw the future. And I'm really not very good you, about seeing the future. You want to invest opposite of what I invest in because that's a sure strategy for improvement on your part. But in this case, I did see the trees, the forest for the trees. And that's because when I was on the aircraft carrier, I saw something amazing as a fighter pilot that was deeply disturbing. And that was the fact that not only can the planes land themselves better and always land better than a human does, when you actually take off in an F-18, you have to go to the catapult, you have to turn to everyone on the left, and you have to show everyone that you're not touching anything, and then you turn to the right, really, I'm not touching anything, and then you hold these handlebars so everybody can see them, and it's only when your hands are on the handlebars and everyone's sure you're not touching anything that they shoot you off the front. That's bad. Because, you know, I have an eight-year-old, and I do the same thing to her. You're not allowed to touch anything when we go into a crystal shop, right? So if you can't touch anything, what does that say about why are you even there? Well, theoretically, maybe you're there to drop bombs or do things that fighter pilots do. Well, at the same time, there was this missile coming out, this tactical Tomahawk missile that you see in the lower inset. And this is a missile that can be fired from over 1,000 miles from its intended target and hit the target within less than a meter precision accuracy always. Fighter pilots cannot do that always. We're not that good. We're not as good as automation. I'm flying the F-18. I see that you're not allowed to take off or land by yourself or touch anything. This missile is going to come together. At this point, it's being shot out of a submarine. It's incredibly stealthy. Fighter pilots aren't that stealthy. These two technologies are going to come together and put me out of a job. And in fact, that did happen last year. The US Air Force reached a, a milestone. It is actually safer for the United States military to send a drone on a fighter bomber mission than it is a human. And one of the things I did is, a lot with the social upheaval that was going around with being a female fighter pilot, which that's a whole nother set of bar stories that I can entertain you with for hours, I decided to get out and go back to school. I got my PhD and I started the Humans and Autonomy Laboratory. It was at MIT and now it's at Duke. There is a joke. It's an implicit joke in the name, but you have to be over 40 to get it for the most part. And for those youngsters in the crowd, you have to go ask someone older what the joke in the name is. <laughs> Despair.com. One of my favorite websites ever. I'm definitely a half glass empty kind of a person. So, you know, I like this innovation. If it can make your job easier, it can probably make it irrelevant. Is that true, right? I mean, I think that's kind of what our human fear is. What's going to happen to us? Are robots going to take our job? And if a robot can take my job, then what does that make me? Are we moving towards the matrix? Just how relevant am I into society? And that's really what we're going to talk about today. I'm going to give you some examples. So it's a brief history of humans and automation. Turn of the century, horse and carriage. People swore that it would never get better than this, right? And when the car came around, this is a Google driverless car, but certainly when the original Model T's came around, people fought like demons to keep them off the roads. Now we're to the point in society where we've got cars that can drive themselves. We'll talk a little bit more about that. They're not really ready for prime time yet, but in with a relatively 100-year time frame, we have come a long way. We've put the driver and the horses out of business. What about this? Wall Street seems exciting. We get to see a lot of that in the press. Guess what? Wall Street has been pretty much been put out of business by this. What is this? Row of high-speed computers. In fact, Chicago is a big part of that. High-speed financial trading, it's all about, and humans are really not in that loop. Not only that, this is a headline out of a newspaper. The New York Stock Exchange floor isn't even good for pictures anymore. That's kind of sad, right? And then, of course, in my own personal life, I love this picture because this is an F-18 Hornet, a plane that I flew. This is an X-47. That is not a cockpit. That is an air intake. That is a drone that does the same thing that does. And it even looks cooler. <laughs> and you don't even have to watch for anybody's hands because you always know it's going to do a good job on the takeoff and the landing. Transportation industries are in big trouble from robotics. Now, we say big trouble. Is that a good thing or it's a bad thing? Ah, we're all bad drivers. Then we would be, I cannot wait for all of you to get off the road. And you know what? You know, I do like coming to Chicago. I like the city. Do you know what I hate about Chicago? I hate it. 
the drivers, the traffic. You know, Chicago will be transformed once we get driverless cars. What's going on these days in the world of research and technology? Well, there's actually a very formal, and by formal I mean funded, effort to get the second pilot out of the cockpit. Now, there's this classic joke in aviation, those of you who are aviators have heard it, the best crew for any plane is a pilot and a dog. And the dog is there to bite the hand of the pilot in case he touches anything, or she. That was encapsulated right here in this cartoon, little dog, coffee pot, I like that. So it's been kind of a joke that we've been going to single pilot operations, but it's not really a joke anymore, it's reality. Military, commercial, United States, worldwide, we're all pushing very quickly to take one of those two guys out of the cockpit. It is going to happen. It is not a question of if anymore. It's just a matter of when. Ryanair, anybody been over on one of the really super cheap airlines in Europe? They're the first ones. They want to get that second guy out of the cockpit or girl. Uh, it's a tremendous cost savings. And in fact, all aircraft are rated to be flown by one. There have been a couple of incidents this week where either a pilot was incapacitated or in fact one died at the controls. All planes must be able to be flown by a single pilot as if the other pilot were not there, and that's why those flights went well. But um, I work for the Defense Advanced, uh, Defense Advanced Research Projects Agency, DARPA. That's not good enough for them. What we want to do is that with, there's a lot of planes where we can't put a lot of automation in, so we're actually literally creating something like R2-D2. We call it R2-A2. We're so clever, right? But it's literally a little robot that you can take into the right seat of any plane, commercial, cargo, passenger, Drop that little guy into the plane, and he basically takes over the functions of a human co-pilot. What's funny is, <laughs> we don't really need that, actually. I mean, that's a way to get some safety protections in the case that the pilot actually does have a heart attack or, or something bad happens. But this little guy right here, Cayman KMAX helicopter, a group of helicopters that have been flying in Afghanistan, they racked up over 3 million miles of just cargo flights, back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. These are little trains that could. Why that's important is because it's going to revolutionize the cargo industry. I mean, a drone has been doing military cargo missions for a long time, and most people don't even really realize it. Of course, until Amazon comes along, you know, in 2013, on my birthday, I thought that was a really great present for me, they announced that they were going to start doing cargo missions, and why that's so important to a researcher my, like myself, I've been predicting it. I was on The Daily Show telling John Stewart that FedEx was going to be a drone one day, and of course, you know, he made fun of me. But then I got the last laugh, right, because then Amazon made this announcement. There's already a company, SF Express in China, that's been delivering packages to customers for some time. Again, the question is not if, but when, and how are we going to do the regulatory infrastructure to wrap around it. And that, of course, brings up the question, well, what about these guys? They already are drones. Every commercial airplane that you fly on can be turned into a drone relatively easily. Cargo planes, the FedExes, the DHLs, the UPSs, they will be drones sooner than you know it. Now, instead of 40 bucks to ship a package overnight, it'd be like $5, right? It's going to happen. Now, will passenger aircraft become drones? No. The technology exists today for a plane to leave the gate by itself, taxi to the runway, take off, fly itself, land itself, and taxi itself back to the gate without a human ever touching the controls. But it won't happen for a passenger aircraft, and that's because wherever you have people, you need people. We need leadership on board to control unruly people, if nothing else, right? And to take over in the cases of, of a certain kinds of emergencies. Why does that really matter to you? What's the future hold? So it is actually possible for you to buy a flying car right now. So there's a couple of rotable car companies in the world for about $300,000, and you have a sport pilot's license. You can fly your own car. These wings actually, they do this cool fold-down thing. But what's happening is they're starting to merge drone technology with flying car technology. There's no technological hurdle. It can happen right now, we know, because it it's, it's being done. But the thing I'm really excited about is this. Google and you know all these airline companies are going to come together and then we're going to have this <laughs> yeah it's coming you know it's it's not going to happen in my near term lifetime i mean we already have flying cars they already exist 
They're just not slick. You're a terrible pilot, by the way. You're, you're terrible drivers. And can you put you in a plane with everybody else like you? I mean, the jockeying that goes on on the roads here in Chicago, are you insane? That's what you would be like in a plane, right? You're not good enough to be a pilot or a driver, honestly. We're all terrible because we'd rather be on our cell phones and texting and watching movies. And so, yes, let's let the automation do the flying and the driving. There's no question that automation reduces uh, fatalities in aircraft and also reduces fatalities in cars. And that's because we have very perishable attention. And so, pretty good, that's, that's, I can't wait for this to happen. Transportation, you know, we can kind of, we get there because we're like, oh, I see, trains have been driving themselves in other countries. Uh, you know, America lags really far behind in automated trains. Pretty much everyone else in the world, including third world countries, have more advanced train systems than the United States does, and that's really a socio-technical issue. It's a, an issue with human attitudes. Um, but so trains are, will eventually get there planes, so, you know, transportation industry, but what about this? This is actually kind of the new frontier of robots. This is called the Baxter. This is a current day robot that for a little over $20,000, you can own one of these yourself. Now, so this would be considered state-of-the-art humanoid robot. So what does Baxter do? Baxter is called a pick-and-place robot. So Baxter is really good at, he'll turn on his static base, he can pick something up and turn it and put it here. Pick something up and put it here. Now, that's not really useful to you in your everyday lives unless you're picking and placing in one spot in your house, but it is pretty useful in some small factories. You can train Baxter to, you know, pick and place in different configurations, and so that's really important because it is starting to raise awareness that you can have robots do these kinds of tasks. So what's a little bit further into the future. This is also a DARPA robot. Remember that crazy DARPA I was talking about before? DARPA will tell you that this robot is designed to save your life. I don't know about you, but if I saw this robot coming after me in like a first response, they're like, oh yeah, like Hurricane Katrina happens and this robot's gonna come and save you. Oh, is it? If I saw this thing coming down the street, I'd be like running running like crazy because I'd be thinking, oh, it's the, it's the Terminator coming to get me. This is Atlas. He is the most, I'm going to call him a he. I'm sorry if I'm a little gender biased there. They paint it pink. Maybe it would be a little softer. Maybe you'd think rescue robot. And it really theoretically is designed to go into first response situations and pick people up and help people out of um, dangerous spots. It is, however, a DARPA project and DARPA is the defense agency, so I would assume that this research would eventually land into the military. A little scary, even though it's supposed to help you, but I think the thing that you need to be really conscious of is it's still very much a research project, and the one thing you've really got going for you, if this robot scares you, is this tail. Is it a tail? What is this tail? Power. This is actually the big kicker to most humanoid robot, and I'd even say all humanoid robot. This can have a power. I mean, it doesn't have to move, so you can permanently plug it in and it's good. This guy, if he's coming after you and he, you're scared of him, you just have to run long enough to unplug the cord and then you're good. It is very much research and development, basic research. We're still working really hard on this robot and you will start to see progress being made, but this robot has difficulty climbing stairs. This robot cannot do dexterous manipulations with their fingers. So there's actually a lot of really basic human tasks that this robot cannot do yet, but maybe one day. Alice seems scary and Honestly, I work with these guys. I got to get with their PR department. Could you put a smiley face or something on that? Because that does not help in your public image. But what we really want is this, right? Isn't that what we really want? I mean, it's all about the Jetsons, right? I really want Rosie the robot who does all of my cooking and cleaning and taking care of the kids and dealing with my husband and blah, 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 blah. So let me show you where we are with that. So this robot, the Willow Garage robot, is called the PR2. Curiously, it also costs $300,000. I'm starting to see a theme here for a robot. So I think I'd rather have a rotable plane than a robot for 300. This is the most advanced home robot that we have right now. This robot is folding a towel. Isn't that sweet? how the robot just kind of smooths it. <laughs> That's so sweet. That's almost human-like, right? Can you see the little eyes up here too? So he's looking really concentrating hard and... <laughs> okay, so remember, state of the art, most advanced. 
if you, for $300,000, you could put this robot in your house to help you with your laundry. <laughs> so there, I have a big major thrust of research on boredom in my lab, no joke, because it turns out that one of the things that happens to the human brain when you're working with robots and you're, you're having to supervise this automation is it can get really boring and tedious. We do some brain imaging, we actually do some behavior, try to do behavioral modification, because if you're trying to be in an environment where you're monitoring robots and they're either doing something really boring, they're just, you know, the system is working like it's supposed to, it gets really boring. Where, where are we now? Oh my God, I mean, just like, seriously? We, we're just getting the, oh my, this is one of my favorite parts. Uh, is it so sweet? It's so sweet, right? It takes a little over four minutes for this robot to fold the towel. And even that, it's only a not very good job of folding the towel. You're almost like rooting for the robot, aren't you, though? You're like watching, like, come on, you can do it. You can, you can do it. Your two-year-old can do, do a better job. Okay. If you have a cleaning service business, I feel you should feel very comfortable that a robot is not gonna take your job anytime soon. Certainly any job that requires any folding, and this is what I was talking about in terms of dexterous manipulation, if your job requires anything like that, feel good, because we're a long way away from making that a commercial item. How do you know then if a robot is coming from your job? I've just given you a few examples, but it turns out I've developed a secret formula for how you know a robot's gonna come get your job. And this is what it's called, it's called the skills, rules, knowledge, and expertise continuum. This is based on some research from Danish researcher Jens Rasmussen, and then I kind of added on to it because I thought he had a good idea in this sense that you've got skills that you have to learn when you do any kind of complex task. So there's a set of behaviors that you have to learn, skill-based behaviors, to do a complex task. In this case of flying, it actually takes a person a couple of years to really get good at seeing all the dials and gauges, and without any thinking to keep the airplane in stable flight. It's the same when you drive. When you first learned how to drive, if I put you in a car, you have to be told, okay, stay between the white lines, and when you're first learning to drive, you tell yourself, stay between the white lines, stay between the white lines, but then after about 20 minutes, it becomes so perceptually easy that you're able to do it again, and you never have to remind yourself to stay between the white lines, actually, until you're a little bit older when you start to lose cognitive capacity. For the most part, this, this is a skill that you have to learn to fly a plane, but once you learn how to interpret the dials and gauges and keep the airplane in balanced flight, it's very automatic. I could jump into a plane today, almost any plane, and be able to keep that thing in balanced flight. May not be pretty at first, but then I would dampen out because that is an automated skill that you have learned in your head. Now, once you learn the skills of how to keep the plane in flight, then you move up the cognitive continuum to something we call rule-based reasoning. And that is where procedures, if-then-else algorithms start to change the way that you deal with events. In this case, you know, if, I, if I've got an engine and a high engine temperature, I look up the checklist, I understand what I need to do to, to resolve that problem, and then I move on once it's resolved. But maybe it doesn't get resolved. Then we've got issues that require knowledge, knowledge-based reasoning. And this is when a person has to reason in an unstructured environment, a person has to think, well, my engine temperature checklist did not fix my problem, and now I either have a fire or, in this case, a dual engine flame out, and I actually don't have a, a set of rules to tell me what to do in this case. Not exactly, because every case is a little bit different. So when you require knowledge-based reasoning, which is reasoning under uncertainty, then you're really stepping away with what, from what a computer can do. And lastly, on the highest edge of the continuum, is expert-based reasoning. And I can promise you that Chesley Sullenberger, who was a very knowledgeable pilot, is, can be sh classified as the expert in doing ditching landings because he has now had to deal with something at the highest degrees of uncertainty that no other pilots or very few pilots ever have to maintain. For those of you who are getting older like me, I like this because what this means is you can't learn how to deal with uncertainty without having dealt with uncertainty. And this is where age and experience comes into play. And so as we go up this cognitive continuum, young people are actually much better pilots. Their reaction times really are faster. Your, your reaction times in your 20s are far superior to your reaction times in your 40s. But good news is, 
your knowledge and expertise goes way up in your 40s because you've just simply had enough time to have all these experiences. Unfortunately, automation can't do that. Automation, robots, whatever, you know, algorithms. Watson is not a knowledge system. It has no expertise. Watson is just a clever parlor trick that can look up through a bunch of rules how to come up with a question to an answer that he's already given. Doesn't require any knowledge, doesn't require any out-of-the-box thinking, just requires a massive memory to go search and filtering to search through those um, data sets. What we really need are robots that can reason under uncertainty. They can't do it, not even close. We're not even anywhere near a robot being able to reason uncertainty. You saw the PR2, it was having struggle with the skills, right? I mean, just trying to fold a towel. I mean, and it had some rules. It was trying to stretch and hold the towel up because then it knew that it had to, to do a half fold because that's the rule. And in fact, the really pretty, the really nice padding down, that's, that was a rule that some engineer codified into the system. So if your job requires a lot of this, you're good. If your job requires a lot of that, be careful. And I think it's hard for people to, to understand the difference. So there's a company right now called Automated Insights that basically puts sports journalists out of business. Most sports articles in most papers today are written by a computer. And people start to get worried. And I had a journalist call me the other day, oh, does that mean my job is going away? I'm like, well, it does if you're a sports journalist. And why does it work for sports journalism? Because it's a very rule-based environment. But where it doesn't work is talking about very complex political, socio-technical issues. And I think what's great about this is that's where humans bring real value. That's where we bring creativity. That's where design comes from. I cannot tell you the number of design projects that I work on where people are trying to develop an automated designer. It's not going to happen. It's not going to happen anytime soon because design, by definition, requires creativity and thinking out of the box. Robots aren't there yet. I really appreciate your time. And I hope you enjoy the rest of the conference.